Uh, can we get the, you know, the volume control on this? Are you? Better now? No. Hi. Is this better? A little? And now? I can't hear, I can't hear any difference on my end. Yes? Okay. Okay, well, uh, I'll start by saying, uh, well, extending a really enthusiastic thank you to the organizers for putting this meeting together. This has been a really wonderful experience, both to, to see colleagues that I hadn't seen for sometimes years and to meet new colleagues that I hope to see often in the future, so this has been fantastic. And also thank you for extending the invitation for me to prevent, uh, present some of my work. <laughs> uh, just to get us started, I'll note, I have a background in zoology and evolution, and I was brought into this enthusiasm by collective behavior, the evolution of cooperation and conflict, I think like many of us here. Uh, but really early on in my trajectory, I was generously introduced to microbial systems. And I remember clearly I saw something like this under the microscope and fell in love with these structures immediately. This is Vibrio cholera growing on a piece of glass. This is a th uh, maximum intensity projection of a three-dimensional structure growing toward you. Uh, this is an example of what is often called biofilm formation, and it's very common among microbes. Uh, but up until the, the, about 10 years ago, we, we hadn't really, we hadn't started to experimentally ass assess like what kinds of evolutionary ecological population dynamic processes occur in here from a, a social evolution perspective. So what I tried to do is, is combine that background with uh, molecular genetic tools to see what's going on in here. And before, before I tell you about some of these experiments, I'll just give you a short background on what biofilms are. And I should, I should also say at the beginning, the term biofilm is a bit, is a bit of a mess. It refers, it's an umbrella term. It, it's used a little bit differently by different people. Uh, so I like to, to explicitly uh, say what I consider to be a biofilm, and that's a group of cells that's often on the surface, but not necessarily, and embedded in a secreted matrix of extracellular polymers. So these, are, these polymers are made by the bacteria themselves, and they have an enormous impact on the structure uh, and, and, and ecology of these systems, as I'm going to tell you about. This is a typical a canonical life cycle of a biofilm that you'll often see in the literature. Cells first encounter uh, a surface, and they can explore this surface with uh, remarkable sophistication as we're uh, learning now uh, from lots of groups. And at some point, they, if the conditions are correct, if they deem them correct, for example, if nutrient concentration is sufficient, then they'll commit to more permanent detachments. They'll begin secreting extracellular material, and that binds cells together and allows them to gain protection from various threats and increased ability to exploit local resources. If these resources run out, then we will often see dispersal events. But this, this step, actually, we don't understand very well. But I'll talk about that later. So I, would, I think many would argue that, uh, that, that biofilm formation is, is a common, if not ubiquitous, part of, of microbial life in the wild. Uh, biofilm biologists often say that all bacteria live most of their lives this way. I'm not sure if that's really true. But uh, there's certainly a lot of evidence that wild isolates of many, many um, species do this at least some of the time. So this is, this is like an alternative, feature, uh, an alternative or other feature of bacterial life that we need to consider in addition to their, their planktonic world, which are, we're more used to thinking about. From an applied perspective, biofilms often cause infections that are very difficult to remove. And in fact, if they become mature enough, then they just have to be cut out uh, surgically, which can be uh, quite devastating for patients. They also grow in the interior of industrial pipes and, and, and probably pipes in your house, and they, they, they cause considerable damage uh, economically. And so understanding how these work has, has practical implications for, for mitigating these, these harmful effects. But, you know, but mostly, for what I'm going to talk about today is just the, the basic biology of these systems. And the perspective that I'm coming from, as I said, is a social evolution perspective. So we have cells immobilized on a surface like this or immobilized in a flock that's floating around. And as I mentioned, the cells are bound together by a secreted matrix of uh, various materials, which I'll talk about in a moment. But what's salient here is that the cells are immobilized in close contact with each other, and this spatial structure 
has an enormous impact, impact on who can affect who, as Kirill noted at the beginning of today. I couldn't agree more, and, and so I'm going to talk today about how this structure arises. I'm not going to go through this in detail because I think uh, the audience is familiar with, with from many wonderful talks here about the different kinds of interactive behavior from consumption of ma material to secretion of material to direct contact. All of these can be either helpful or harmful to neighbors depending on the details of what we're thinking about. But I want to, to pay attention in particular to the matrix material itself. This is its own class of interactive behavior and I have a, I have a special affection for it because it's it's unique and defining for biofilm growth. And it's also a little bit, whoop, it's also a little bit nebulous in uh, its categorization with respect to these, these types of features. So it is a secreted product, but it's often a complex of many different things that some, of the, some easily diffuse and some don't. And uh, it's, some of these things are taken back up by cells or by, by other species. And of course, it mediates the, the proximity that's required for direct contact. So I think understa understanding the matrix was, was my first step to getting into biofilm work, and I'm, I'm, just, I'm still doing it. I think I probably always will be. It's very complicated, it turns out. OK. So what does the matrix do? Very broadly, it, it, it attaches cells to each other into surfaces. It, conf it confers structural strength and resilience against uh, exogenous stress, including antibiotic treatments, famously. Uh, it has other functions that we are going to discover. It's, we don't know a lot about how the matrix is really organized at a very detailed level, and it's a very active uh, area of research in the, the biofilm biochemistry community, and it's increasingly active in the ecology community, too. But as I said 10 years ago, we didn't really... Uh, that is... Uh, that's... In principle, yeah. So some, some things that bacteria secrete, of course, are responded to by other bacteria. We get into, a, it's not clear if any of those molecules also serve as a structural element in matrices like this. Um, so I think it's unclear. But they certainly might retain other signaling molecules, which is quite important. It, it, the, the matrix concentrates solutes uh, on the basis of their, their diffusivity, hydrophobicity, electrostatic properties. Okay, but I'm interested here, and I'm gonna go back, this is a little bit old, but I'm gonna go back to the, the earliest product that I did on this just to give you a sense of the trajectory of, of the thinking. And my questions are, how does the matrix influence population dynamics, ecology, and evolution in biofilms? How can we join these perspectives? And the first question I, I asked here was the, uh, the, the really basic one, does this material serve as a, as a, a public good? Is it, well, what happens when you mix cells that can produce it and cells that can't? And to, to study this question, I'm going to use the, the model system, uh, Vibrio cholera, which is famous for causing pandemic cholera in humans. Biofilm formation is really important for this pathogen, both inside the host, where it helps them survive passage through the gut, um, and is also presumably putatively involved in pathogenesis directly. It's also involved in escape from the host. This material is... Um, these biofilm, these biofilm chunks are basically better able to, to survive passage into the environment. And then once cholera is in a marine environment, it uses biofilm formation to attach to uh, shed chitin, which it eats. So, so, so the matrix is involved in all, in all elements of its life. Okay, so the way I'm going to approach this question is I'm going, I've, I've made mutants that either produce matrix constitutively or not at all. I'm not going to really go into the details of these, these deletions, but suffice it to say that I've, I've basically made slightly cartoonish versions of the real bacteria in order to isolate this behavior and, and assess its competitive properties. I've also made them immotile. That's the flaw A mutation. And you'll see that the only difference between them is this VPSL deletion, which is what causes this strain to not make matrix. And it also gains a big growth rate advantage as a result. It's very expensive to make this material. So I'm going to grow these two strains together in a microfluidic device, which is a, 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 li a little tunnel where we can flow liquid through. And for comparison, I'm also going to grow them in liquid environments, and we'll, we'll see what happens in these two, these two types of, of setups. Okay. So if we look at biofilm formation of these two strains but on their own, we see that the EPS plus, so EPS stands for extracellular polymeric substances. It's kind of a, it's a moniker for, it's, a, it's, a, it's synonymous with matrix production, so I'll use them together. This strain makes more biofilm than the other, which is not shocking. That's a, that, this is well known. 
So my, my thoughts by default was that, that maybe this, this strain that does not produce the material would get pulled up by the other when they're in co-culture, but it was actually the other way around, and we had an indication of a, of a, a competitive or suppressive interaction from one strain to another. And to get a full, to, to see how, you know, the, whether or not this is frequency dependent, uh, we do this experiment for many different starting conditions of the population, so we have an initial abundance of the EPS producing strain and then a final abundance. That this is after, I think, 48 hours. But uh, the, the, time, the time of the experiment affects the, the magnitude of the results, not the sign. So we see that the, 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 the secreting strain always wins no matter where it starts. So there's, there's no frequency dependence here. It, it simply wins. If we do the same experiment in liquid, then we get the opposite result. The other strain wins, and this, this is consistent with the fact that it has a much higher growth rate. And it also says that the competitive advantage of the secreting strain has something to do with space in particular of the, of the biofilm environment. So to, to get a feeling for this, and a lot of the data I'm going to show you are, are image heavy, because this, this is how we get a feeling for what's happening in these systems. There's a lot of microscopy. All of the, basically, all of the data except for liquid controls are microscopy. Uh, Raghu gave a, a more thorough explanation of this yesterday in his wonderful talk, but I'm, I'm going to, to just tell you really quickly again for a refresher uh, how we image these things. So we use something called a confocal microscope that's able to isolate optical sections uh, of this sample. So it takes light only from a chosen focal plane, and by, by taking many of these samples successively, we can build a three-dimensional picture of the system. Okay, and so this is what it looks like. This is the progress of competition between the two where the EPS secreting strain starts at a very low abundance. So clearly there's, there's, a, a, there's a spatial competition between them along the substratum. There's no motility here, remember, so there's, there's nothing happening in the planktonic phase except for removal of cells that fall off. And I, I, I'm not showing you here, but, but the, the clusters of red cells are displacing the blue ones from the glass. They're not just growing over them. Okay, so this was, this was cool. It's surprising on intuition, but also consistent with a really great and interesting prediction made by Kevin Foster and Joel Xavier in a, a 2007 PNAS paper, which has become uh, something of a landmark in the field. So I'd encourage you to look at that if, you, if you're interested. I want to show you just this just to show you how far we've come in our ability to, yes. We're not. It's 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 difficult to say. I think like a, someone with the with the with the right tools could see to what to could tell what, to what extent they're really pushing, but I think the the best like null expectation is that the blue cells fall off more easily, and whenever they fall off, there's there's the, the on average they're just replaced by neighboring red cells if they're there, and so there's the, that's my guess. But but. But in my like, heart of hearts, I think they're also pushing a little bit. Yeah. OK, so this is to, to show you how far we've come in our ability to resolve what is happening in these structures. So the microscopy has improved. The fluorescent reporter constructs have improved. The image processing imp has improved. Everything has improved. So this is only over about seven years. And this is work that was innovated by Knud Drescher while he was at Princeton and is now developed further in his group at MPI Marburg with a, an extraordinarily talented image processing postdoc named Raimo Hartmann. So I just wanted to show you this, but I also, there's something in here that I think is intriguing. It leads to the next, uh, the next question I have. So we, if we look, uh, I've, been, I've been really interested, I've been stressing here competition along the surface, but in fact, we have to also think about the, the interface of, of, with the planktonic phase. There's, there's an entire volume of these red clusters, um, and, and, and we're not really, at this point, we're not inspecting what's happening on the outer surface. And I want to add it at this point that, that our interpretation is, is that the red cells are basically, co they are co this trait is cooperative, but it's limited in the extent of, to where the benefit goes. So the cells that are producing the material seem to retain its benefits more than they distribute it uh, elsewhere. So the scales of competition and cooperation are, are, are a common and important theme. Okay, so I've shown you that matrix, matrix producing cells have a strong competitive advantage despite a, a growth disadvantage, a growth rate disadvantage. But what about uh, incoming cells that are introduced after a biofilm has, has already grown, right? Presumably cells that encounter a new environment don't always just have a clean slate to occupy. There's something there already, and that's the question I'm going to ask here. Okay. 
So this is, a, this is a repetition. I'm asking what determines group entry and group departure. I'm going to focus on entry, though. OK, so a quick rundown of what this experiment looks like. I'm going to, this is the vocabulary I'm going to use. So I have a resident strain. This is the biofilm that was grown in advance, and an invading strain, which is introduced after the fact. I grow these resident biofilms, and then I introduce the uh, invading strain later and then image, and then we see how the system evolves, or excuse me, how it develops, what the population dynamics are after this. There's no, there's no exploration of evolutionary change at all to this point. So we, 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 we study the, this process for different types of planktonic, uh, different planktonic strains that vary in motility and matrix production, just, to, just to, for completeness. But I'm only going to show you the ones that are both motile and able to produce matrix, able to produce biofilm. That's the most realistic case, and it's the most interesting. So I'm going to focus on that one. But the other cases are, are the same. OK. So this is a control experiment. So the invading strain is introduced by itself and then allowed to grow over the course of uh, one day. It grows fine. It's a biofilm-producing strain of cholera. This is what happens if there's a resident strain present already. So it's quite different. The ability to colonize the surface, uh, the ability to colonize overall is reduced. Colonization is limited to where the residence is not located. And the subsequent growth of this strain is actually reduced. Us. It's, it's, there's, there are fewer cells here than there were at the beginning. So there's something about the presence of an, existing, of an existing biofilm that discourages attachment of new ones. And this is true even if the strain that's introduced is the same as the one that is grown there in the first place. OK. So this, this is an important control. If you, if you inoculate these two together, then they coexist. This is a time-dependent thing. It's who's there first and who's there second that determines the outcome of this experiment. OK. So as a, in a molecular, this is in a molecular biology context, we need to, or we want to see if we can break this phenotype, the invasion resistance. And we naturally look to the biofilm matrix itself, because this controls the structure of the, of the biofilm residence population. And the, the image on the left, which I showed earlier but didn't explain, is, is some really wonderful work from the labs of Finad Yildiz and Stephen Chu in California that was incredibly innovative and, and beautiful localization of different components of the matrix of biofilm. So the cells here are in blue. Uh, there are three different components shown, green, gray, red. They're all interesting, but I'm, I'm going to show you just one because it's the most interesting, particularly with respect to this invasion resistance phenotype. That protein is called RBMA, and it, it, it causes cells to stick to each other and also a bit to the surface. The gene name's not terrifically important, but I just, we need to use something just to refer to it. OK. So this experiment is, this, is essentially the same as what I showed already, but instead of just imaging the day of colonization and the day after, we do a long time series and, and see what happens uh, for many days after, after we try and invade a biofilm. This is a, a recapitulation of what I showed earlier. This is the invading, the, the invading strain does well. If there's no one present, it colonizes well and it grows well. If the, if the parental strain, this is, if this is a, a technical description of the strain's phenotype, but it's, it's the same as what we were looking at in the, the first project I showed you. If this, present, if this strain is present already, then the, invasion, the invading strain is, is uh, incapacitated in its ability to, to grow, uh, excuse me, to colonize and to grow. Although my, I should say, after talking, um, with people here, my interpretation of like elimination versus low abundance is different. So they're not gone. They're just not able to compete nearly as well as if they're introduced at the same time as the resident. If we use this matrix mutant, the result is dramatically different. So first of all, the invading strain colonizes somewhat more, and it's able to grow an order of magnitude more than uh, with the with the the wild type present. Um, some may be interested that the, the, in this case, the RBMA resident is displaced itself. It's outcompeted. I'm not showing that here, but it is. And also, very, I think, the most interestingly, the, the invading strain is able to percolate through the entire system this now, which is, which is dramatically different from what we saw before. This is dependent on motility. So they're, they're not just, uh, well, I'll leave it at that. If cells without a flagellum can't get in. 
Okay, so as a, as a social evolutionist, I'm now interested in whether or not this ability to resist invasion can be given from one strain to another. Uh, this, this also motivates uh, different interpretations of how the matrix is structured. So what I've done here is mixed the two, the mutants and the, the, the parental resident together and thrown the invading strain on. And what we can see is that the invading strain can only enter where the mutant is. And we can repeat this just to, to get a, a fuller picture of what's happening. We can, we can make the resident biofilm uh, with different combinations, different frequencies of the, the mutants and the parental strain, and the ability of the invading one to grow to accumulate biomass is roughly a linear function of, of how much of the, the mutant was present in the first place. So this tells us that the, the invading strain simply occupies what volume was available uh, by, the, by the, the, the mutant strain. So this was exciting to me because it, I it's, it's an unusual case, I think, of, of an ecologically or, uh, motivated experiment um, giving us a, an idea of how the matrix is structured. So this, this predicts that the RBMA protein, which is important for invasion resistance, is not shared from cells that are making it to cells that are not. And we can test that idea directly uh, using some molecular genetics tricks. So we, we go onto the chromosome of cholera, we introduce uh, an epitope at the end of this gene, and this way when it's expressed, it has a little tag on it, and we can introduce a, an anti, a, a antibody that's specific to that tag with a, with a fluorescent molecule conjugated to it, and then localize where that protein component is in the biofilms. So we do that, and sure enough, here's our producing strain mutants, and here's where the, the RBMA protein is. It only localizes to the producing cells, as we predict. So just for, this, this was just for kicks, basically, but, but I was also curious whether or not this protein could be shared from cells that make it to other cells that make it. And we can test that idea as well by mixing this strain, which produces the tagged version of the protein, with uh, a wild-type strain that makes an untagged version. And actually, we see the same thing, which I, th which I found to be very surprising. And this indicates that the, this RBMA protein really localizes to the cell lineages that are producing it, and it, it, it defines cell lineages as they expand from a surface during biofilm growth, which uh, I think has important implications for understanding how spatial structure arises in cholera in particular, but I think it's also it's, it's important to explore for this effect in other species too. And I'm going to show this. I have the same picture that Kirill did, but we both love this, I'm sure. Um, this is the, uh, the fish experiments by the Borsi group. Um, and if we, look at, if we look close up at, at two strains here, we can see well-defined boundaries between different clusters of two different strains. And this, this repeats throughout their, their samples. So this is kind of consistent with the fact that, with our prediction that, that, um, that, that clonal bunches of biofilms tend to, there, there's interdigitation inter on this scale, but not on the scale of, of um, 5, 10, 15 cell lengths. And if we look at a larger scale, however, we do see on this scale extensive mixing between different species. And this is a biofilm grown on a person's tooth. This is a real you know, in situ biofilm. So there's, there's many cases right here is a good, a good one where a cluster of this blue strain is clearly not permitting entry of the orange cells around it. But there are other areas where there is more mixture. And so what I, all I mean to say by this is that the results I'm conveying here are not meant to, to, to convince you that I think that, uh, that all biofilms are monospecies, that's empirically false, so that's not defensible, but, but rather that in order to understand how this structure arises, we need to have a, a bit of mechanistic understanding about how biofilms are assembled and how they work, how the matrix works in particular. Okay. So, what I've talked about so far is how the, the cholera matrix orients cells so as to discourage entry of new cells into the community. So I've just described now how two different ways that the matrix can give it a competitive advantage to the cells that are making it, and there are many more. So we've done other studies indicating that, uh, this is with, with uh, my colleague Knut Drescher, which indicate that, that producing a lot of matrix and forming thick biofilms allow you to also stabilize other cooperative secretion phenotypes, like chitinase secretion, which digests polymers outside of cholera in marine environments. So there are a lot of reasons to make matrix, but in, uh, among wild isolates, there are many strains that don't. So why, why is that? 
So I'm going to talk a little bit about, about why this might be the case. And there, there's, there are some intuitive reasons why. We can think about trade-offs, for example. And something I didn't tell you about my first project is that uh, cells that produce matrix like this are great at competing for space on surfaces, but they're terrible at leaving. They're unable to disperse very well, whereas the, the, blue, the blue strain, the non-matrix secreting strain, whenever a cell division event occurs here, more likely than not, that cell is released into the outflow, and so they're excellent at dispersal. So this trade-off between local competition and dispersal can obviously, the, the balance of this trade-off or the balance of, of, of uh, patch residence time and metapopulation properties can select for strains that either don't make matrix or make, make it very rarely and, and they will be just fine. And in fact, wild type, wild type cholera isn't actually either of these things. It switches between matrix production and non-production and it does that in a way so as to get as much of the benefits of production for local competition as possible while maintaining the ability to leave. So, 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 so this is not like the entire picture, but it does help us to understand the core ecological um, factors and the core selective forces that, that govern why bacteria do this, why they make matrix and why they don't, and when they will and when they won't. Okay, so I'm good on time. So I think I'm going to show you one more project that has to do with the same question, but, ha but, but the, the uh, purpose here is to show you that the complex interactions between environmental conditions and biofilm architecture uh, are both difficult to anticipate and they can have a very strong influence on population dynamics. Okay, so for this, uh, for this bit of the talk, I'm going to tell you about a different model organism. This is Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which we've heard about from several uh, great talks already. On the left is Pseudomonas growing in a microfluidic device like the one I've already talked to you about. And its biofilms are different, to be sure, but uh, have, a, have a, a related structure to what we see in cholera with these, these mushroom tower type of things. If you put Pseudomonas into a, a more complicated flow environment, this serpentine type of chamber that we have on the right, then we see something quite different. So first of all, uh, cells occupy the side surfaces of this environment, so the, the walls of this, this uh, serpentine chamber. Uh, but not only do they grow biofilms there, but they, they kind of exude matrix material into the liquid phase above them. And this has to do with the way flow around these corners generates forces on these corners as it does so. Uh, but what's really interesting, what's extra interesting about this is that those, those streamers, as Knut calls them in this, in this really great paper that he uh, uh, des described these systems in, um, these streamers will catch debris that's flowing through the system, and that includes other cells. So the red cells here are introduced after the green one has already been, been allowed to produce biofilm in, inside this chamber. And Knut and Howard Stone and, and Bonnie were really interested in how this, this uh, streamer phenomenon can clog chambers that has important, for example, industrial implications. Um, but I was interested in whether or not this would change our competition results, because if there's a structure in the, liquid, in the liquid catching cells that fall off easily, then maybe our competition results with respect to matrix secretion is just not, it's not going to hold here. So uh, this is how I'm going to ask, this is how I'm going to study that question. So we have simple flow environments with just a, a plain piece of glass with flow wafting over it, and we have more complex flow environments. Uh, I'm, instead of using a chamber like this, I'm going to use one that has intermittent um, column obstacles. And this is meant to, to represent a cross-section of uh, packed soil, for example, an idealized packed soil. And the key difference here is that flow is relatively simple here, but it's, you know, it's complicated here. It has, to, it has to wind in between these, these columns, and it creates, uh, it, it creates the... the, um, uh, the it creates the forces that, that, that cause these, streamer, um, these streamers to, to uh, depart from biofilms as they grow. Okay, so a lot of this work was done by a really enterprising undergrad that I advised at, uh, when I was still at Princeton, Deirdre. Uh, she did fantastic work. And what we did here is a similar approach to the beginning. We have a wild type strain that naturally makes matrix and, and also devotes energy to growth. And we have a matrix mutant. This is a PEL mutant in a PA14 background, just for those interested. Uh, PEL is the, is the primary polysaccharide of its biofilm matrix. They don't make PSL. So we have a PEL mutant that's otherwise the same as wild type, but it can't make biofilms very well. 
Okay. And what I'm going to do here is, is show you uh, how the system changes, so the change in wild type frequency as a, as a function of its initial frequency. It's the same kind of plot that I showed at the beginning, slightly different format for clarity here. And I'm going to do this experiment in, in two different chambers. The simple one, and what we see here is the same results as we got in the Vibrio cholera case. The matrix secreting wild type strain outcompetes the other. But in a more complicated flow environment, uh, we see a, a, a beautiful shift to negative frequency dependent selection. So now we have co coexistence of the two, which was consistent with what, uh, what I was you know, thinking might happen. So I was very proud. I thought, OK, we guessed this correctly. That's great. But if we look in detail at these chambers, we can find those streamer structures, and there are no other, there's no red cells in them. So that's not, that's not actually the explanation for what's happening. And this was, uh, this was a little depressing because we, we really thought this was, we, we thought we got it, but it, it took a while to, to kind of tease apart what, another explanation for this. But we, what we noticed um, was that if, if we looked closely here and we could see that, that many regions between these columns were actually completely blocked by biofilm growth. And this was related to and consistent with what uh, others had found about the consequences of streamers in biofilms. And so we guess that maybe because flow is blocked, there might be regions of these chambers where a matrix deficient strain, which is susceptible to shear, removal by shear, could, could be happily growing because they no longer have to worry about being removed. And we can test that idea by performing this experiment. So the same thing where you inoculate the two strains together. And then after imaging them, we can flow fluorescent beads through the system. And this is a trick that... Uh, uh, fluid dynamics researchers use to, to understand where flow is going in a system and where it's not. So when, when, when we do this, we see good evidence for this interpretation that, that places where the PEL-A, the matrix mutant strain, is accumulating are the places where flow has been blocked. And, and this, we can assess, it's, it's messy, like these are noisy experiments, but, but over, the, over the, um, the entire chamber, this, is, this has a strong statistical signature. So this is a great example, I think, of how um, relatively unintuitive feedbacks between environmental flow conditions and matrix and biofilm architecture can have important consequences for the, uh, the population dynamics of matrix accretion, and I'm guessing many other traits of interest. But this is, uh, bacteria often grow in environments like this, so we have to think about it. This, this is, the, this is the, the message here. Okay, so just to recap, uh, I've discussed how matrix secretion exerts a, a major influence on population dynamics in biofilms. Uh, I've, I would speculate that it's important for ecology and evolution in biofilms very broadly. And the interaction between in, in the environment and biofilm structure can be very, they're very difficult to anticipate, so we just have to do experiments and see what happens. I have the right amount of time, so I'm gonna tell you about uh, one more project. I'm, I'm interested in general in, in how the biofilm growth process alters fundamental ecological properties of bacterial systems. So I've done this with respect to the invasion of colonizing cells into an existing biofilm population, but uh, as a segue into Bruce's talk later, I want to also think about other important features of bacterial life, and one of the most important is exposure to bacteriophages. This is a uh, a ubiquitous threat to bacteria in the natural environment. We know there's, there's decades of, and decades of very beautiful work on the ecology and evolution of these systems. Uh, but we, we're just starting to learn now about how biofilm production influences this interaction. Uh, and I would argue that in order to get a full picture, we have to look really closely at infection dynamics on a single cell level. Okay, so I'm sure this is probably familiar, but just, to, just as a refresher, this is a, a, a typical lytic phage life cycle. You have a cell on the left, everything's fine. A, 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 a bacteriophage attaches to it, it injects its genome, it quickly hijacks the, the host's intra, uh, cytoplasmic machinery to, to make more uh, uh, copies of itself. Eventually, it degrades the host cell wall, the host lyses, and these new phages pop out, and they're ready to infect new hosts. 
uh, so this, is, this can be devastating, is, is often devastating for natural bacterial populations. Okay, so, but my, so, so what I want to do is track this process micro, uh, under, under the microscope. And there are different ways to achieve this, but what I thought we could do is to manipulate the phage genome such that when it's introduced to the host, not only is the phage proceeding with its infection, but we we'll get a signature of the infection. The host changes color, so now we can see which hosts are infected and which aren't. And uh, we get a little window, basically, before they die. And importantly, the reason why I, I, the reason why I wanted to do this instead of uh, just tagging the phages directly is because this method allows the next generation of phages to also make their host fluorescent. So we just get that we get this tool that's maintained throughout the duration of an, of an infection. Okay. So these are just some pictures to show you that the system works. Uh, from left to right, we have a, a, a small group of cells growing happily. There's, an, a, there's a division event. Uh, there's actually another one here. And we get a strong signal of phage infection. The, these dotted outlines are, are added um, after the fact to show you where a cell used to be um, before it lysed. And after cells lysed, of course, the, all the fluorescent protein just quickly diffuses away and we, do, we get no more signal. Okay, so, how, so w now we want to use this tool to get an idea for how phage infection can proceed in biofilm populations. And the way that I do this experiment is pretty simple. So we grow a biofilm in a microfluidic device. This is E. coli. I forgot to say the last slide. This is E. coli biofilms and phage T7. The reason we're able to do this is because T7 is so easily genetically manipulable. E. coli is nice too. Okay, so then we introduce phages. We give them a pulse. We also did experiments where we throw them in continuously. We look under, under the microscope and we, we just see what happens. Okay, so here we have a biofilm. Phages are introduced. And sure enough, the population is obliterated, basically, by phage infection. So at this point, I was really, I was quite thrilled that this system was working. This took a lot of time to optimize the, the reporter system and the microscopy and every little feature of this. It takes, it, the, the, it's, it's, it can be quite picky. So that was amazing, but this is actually, I was kind of frightened at this point because this is what happens in a liquid culture. Most of the cells die, some are left over, some might be resistant. There's probably, uh, so you can see cells rounded up here. Uh, these, these have had their cell walls digested but they haven't lysed yet. There, there may be a resistant cell up here. On a large enough spatial scale, we would certainly see resistant cells the same way that you get in a planktonic population when you do this experiment. But I was, I was, uh, I was a little worried we wouldn't get anything like anything else. Uh, and so we thought, okay, well, let's try and push this a little bit further. And of course, we did in the end. But we had to we had we had to grow biofilms for a long time. So what I'm showing you here are plots of biofilm population size normalized to the initial point at which phages were introduced. And we grow biofilms for different lengths of time before we introduce the phages. So in this case, we've grown for 12 hours. Phages introduced, biofilm dies. Phages introduced after 24 hours, biofilm dies. Um, and so on and so on. Okay, so we, we were concerned, but if we let these biofilms grow for long enough, then we see something else. So the biofilms no longer die when we add phages, and this stays the same as long as, you know, if you keep going. So there's, a, there's an abrupt transition here before which Biofilms are killed by phage infection the same way we would expect in a liquid culture of susceptible hosts. And after which, there is no killing. And it's not because the cells are not susceptible anymore. They haven't been exposed to phages before this, so they weren't, there was no selection for resistance. Also, if you, if you take these biofilms and disrupt them back into a liquid culture, you can infect them again. So there's something specific to the biofilm architecture that causes this. Here's just some time series for you. So this is exactly what I've just described. You can notice a, a big difference between this purple and green case is the size of the biofilm at the beginning. So there's a transition in the size. Um, and we're also interested in other kinds of architectural transitions. And, we, and, and naturally, we look again to the biofilm matrix, which is different in this case than it was for cholera. Yeah.
uh, why is why is why is this one why is this growing? So this one has a short period of growth before the fade is to kill it. Is, yeah. Right. So why is this slope steeper? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, so that's a good question. I think that the uh, our interpretation is that when biofilms get this big and you're growing them in, in nutrient-poor media, the nutrients diffusing into the population are depleted before they reach the, the rest of the, the entire population. So it's actually not the entire population growing. And so, rel so if we normalize to the initial population size, then, they're, then, then I think that's responsible for this effect. So, so, so. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. yeah. We introduce them in the in the same medium that the bacteria are growing in. Yeah, these are subject to flow. Well, these are growing. I mean, if you if you if you if these these are growing, and so are these. Like the, these these populations are expanding. So these these cells on the outer edge are certainly growing, without question, which you can see here. Like the, these populations are continuing to grow. Okay. Right, yes, so the, the, this is a cartoon picture of the E. coli biofilm matrix that has a bunch of different pieces. Uh, in line with the experiments that I showed you before, we're interested in how this matrix architecture that controls this result that we found. And so we systematically deleted these things and saw what happens. That's the, that's our kind of bread and butter approach. So I'm going, so now I'm going to show you plots stacked up on top of each other because all of these biofilms were grown for 72 hours, then phages were added, and it's the same type of plot format that I showed you in the, the slide before. So wild type survives phage exposure, so do biofilms lacking flagella, so do biofilms lacking cellulose, but not biofilms lacking these things called curly fibers, which are these amyloid structures that poke out of the cells and entangle them, in, especially in the topmost layers of the biofilm. This is a uh, great work by Regina Hengus group in Berlin to show how curly localizes in biofilms. And we can use other molecular genetic tricks to, to plot or to track the, uh, the production of this material as a function of time in biofilms. So this is a time series in which, in which the entire biofilm at each time point has been collapsed into one vertical line in which we plot the uh, intensity of curly production as a function of height. And, but looking at this figure in comparison with the one from the slide before, we can see that the, this matrix protein is produced right, at the, right in the, the correct time for this transition from susceptibility to tolerance to occur. Yeah? That's a great question. Yes, they do. Yeah, so there, there's sporadic infection along the outer periphery, but it just it never progresses into the middle. And eventually, you just don't, it, you don't detect it very much anymore. It's like the... I'm gonna, I'll, I'll, I think you'll get in, I'll touch this in the next slide, but yes, that's, that's a great question, thank you. Okay, um, so this is, a, this is the last uh, experimental slide I have. Um, we, we speculated on the basis of this result that curly fibers would change the permeability of biofilms to phages. The phages can't get in, then they can't cause the infection. And we can test this directly by this time staining phages so we can localize them by microscopy and then looking to see where they, where they diffuse to uh, in, in biofilms. So on the left, we have a wild type. And this is a, this is a slightly uh, confusing picture, but this is a, uh, an intensity projection in Z and X. So we're just looking sideways at a biofilm. It grows up, you're looking straight into the side, and you're looking kind of through the whole thing. And we do that so that you can see just how many phages there are along the whole surface. And there's a lot. So these biofilms are growing but they're covered in phages that are not infecting the cells inside. In uh, biofilm lacking curly, sure enough, the phages are able to diffuse in. And, and this was a really ambitious effort from Lucia, who uh, is a fantastic and really hardworking student. She wanted to see if we could recapitulate this result in vitro. So, there's a lot of stuff going on in these biofilms. There's lots of cells, and the cells are heterogeneous in their surface structure. There's other, there's things that we can't completely account for. So her, her thought was that what, maybe we can purify this matrix components and add it to uh, beads, a proxy for cells, and then see if this thing is recapitulated. We can do this. 
Okay, so luckily if you purify CSGA, which is the monomer component of Curly, it will spontaneously polymerize in uh, media. So that's what this orange stuff is. That, those are curly fibers in the absence of cells, and the, the, blue, the blue things are phages. So clearly curly by itself doesn't prevent phages from entering like a, a cluster. And if we take those beads that I mentioned, the beads don't prevent phages from entering either. They are, the phages are able to diffuse through the, the pores between uh, packed beads. But um, I, I think this is really awesome. There's, if you put these two together, then the, then the, the curly fibers spontaneously form clumps with the beads, and these, uh, these curly bead clumps are, are not um, permissive to, to phage diffusion. So we think that this is a, there's, there's more to, you know, to interpret this fully, and, and uh, this, this paper is in revision now. There are many, many more experiments to, uh, to support this interpretation, but I just want to show you this uh, to give you a sense of, of how much we can do by thinking about matrix material and how it can combine with other objects, and even in a simple way, to have significant uh, impacts on biofilm ecology. So this is going to be, the ecological implications of this are going to be an important part of uh, my lab moving forward. Um, I've also worked with Vani Bucci at UMass Dartmouth to develop a simulation framework that's specific to the system, so we'll, we'll be developing a, a, an interaction between our experimental and our, and our computational frameworks for this problem. Um, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. And I want to say thank you to all of my very cherished colleagues at Princeton who have had the, the great pleasure to work with for, for many years. And uh, my colleagues uh, in Germany, where I've had a fantastic time working for the past few years. Knut Drescher is a close friend and uh, the group leader at, at the Max Planck. Lucia, Praveen, and Raimo were all instrumental for the phage project. Lucia for all of the experimental execution, pretty much. Praveen is a, is a genius geneticist and, and helped translate the phage visualization idea into like a real, into reality. And Raimo is an image processing specialist, as I said. So thank you for your time. Thanks again to the organizers. Thank you.